Hello again, or for the first time for most of you. Uh, welcome to We'll Tell You What We're Reading. We are so sorry for the, uh, we had a few minutes delay there. Somebody, me, um, accidentally started the live stream for our November episode of We'll Tell You What We're Reading. That's what I get for being prepared and preparing the links far in advance. I am now definitely doing September 28th. And it is all good now. So again, I apologize for the delay and I thank you for your patience. Is it working? Yes, it is. I just wanted to double check it really was working. Um, again, or for the first time, my name is Laura Bernheim and I am the head of reference at the Waltham Public Library. I am joined today by my colleagues, Liz Rior and Greg Carter. We're gonna share some titles with you. I'm also very excited to say that after um, a month hiatus, most of our book clubs are coming back for the month of October. Last night, um, our Initiating Inspiration Book Club did meet and had a very successful meeting. And the rest of our book clubs will be joining in October. This Saturday, uh, please join us for a discussion of Barbarian Days by William Finnegan. On Monday, October 4th, please join us for Tell Us What You're Reading, which is basically like this, except you get to participate as well. On Wednesday, October 13th, we are reading Freshwater by Akweke Emetsi. And on Monday, October 18th, um, for our science fiction and fantasy book club, uh, we'll be reading and discussing The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. All of the links, the Zoom links for these can be found on our library website under events and book clubs. Or you can also email me as well at lbernheim at minlib.net. Uh, once again, as always, I want to thank the friends of the Waltham Public Library, without whom this program and none of our programs would be possible. They have paid for the professional Zoom account, which allows us to live stream on YouTube. And we're going to continue this show even well past the pandemic because we love doing it and we love sharing these titles with you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz. Hello, everybody. I hope you are all having a wonderful day. I'm excited to share these titles with you. Um, oops, not actually share, but present. Wonderful. Okay. So I have four titles to talk about today. The first one is Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch by Rivka Galchen. Um, this historical novel is set in Württemberg, Germany in the year 1618. So, you know, just a couple of days ago. It follows Katerina, Kel Katerina Kepler, the mother of the famous mathematician Johannes Kepler, uh, during the later years of her life. Accused of being a witch by someone in her village, um, Katerina navigates the 17th century legal system as an illiterate and incredibly confident, although some might say stubborn, uh, widow. Now, this historical novel doesn't have any science fiction or like fantasy elements to it. So if you're looking for something along the lines of A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness, this isn't the same sort of type of historical witchcraft novel, um, but it is very well written. Um, and it is, it is truly scary to read about the treatment of primarily women who were accused of witchcraft during this period in time, um, you know, 1618, a lot of people in Europe, you've got the plague coming back again to, you know, do stuff. And a lot of women were uh, accused of, of causing sowing uh, chaos because of pacts, alleged pacts with the devil. Um, this novel is told through letters, diaries, and court testimonies. It does get a bit dry at times um, where you're like, come on, just keep going. But I, I want to believe that's a conscious choice on the part of the author um, to the repetitiveness, um, just because it must have been so repetitive to have to go through the experience of being accused of witchcraft and hear the same people tell the same lies over and over again. So I'm going to give I'm going to give the author that little bit of credit. My next title is Fuzz by Mary Roach. When nature breaks the law, uh, Mary Roach is one of my favorite science writers. Um, her latest book, Fuzz, is an exploration into the intersection of the natural world, mainly animals, but also some plants, and law enforcement. So Mary takes you, I'm still working on this book, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, in it, Mary takes you along as she attends a conference on animal crime scene investigation, um, leopard logistics, birth control for pickpocket monkeys, 
municipal waste management and bear appetites uh, and so much more. Um, it's written with Mary's characteristic charm and wit. Um, that makes me really, I, I would love to travel with her as she's doing research for these books because it's just, she just weaves her way around the globe and is just so, so delightful to read, um, read her work. I highly recommend this title for fans of nature uh, forensics because there's, it's very interesting to learn about what needs to be looked for if you think an animal has killed a person instead of a human. Um, uh, and people who just like general science writing. This is a great choice. So my next book is The Secret Life of Fungi by Aaliyah Whiteley. Um, so just full disclosure, I haven't actually started this yet. It is in my queue and I'm very excited to start reading it um, because over the last few months, I have become obsessed with identifying wild mushrooms, not eating them really, but just like being able to know what they are because if any group of organisms on this planet are descended from, you know, extraterrestrial species, it is fungus because they are so weird um, and so fascinating and so diverse. So this is just the description from the publisher since I haven't actually read it yet. Um, fungi can appear anywhere from desert dunes to frozen tundra. They can invade our bodies and live between our toes or our floorboards. Okay. They are unwelcome intruders or vastly expensive treats and symbols of both death and eternal life. But despite their familiar presence, there's still much to learn about the eruption, growth, and decay of their secret interconnected world. Um, so even though mushrooms are everywhere, fungus is everywhere, we really don't know a whole lot about it because it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's not a bacteria, it's like this whole other group of organisms. And they're just, I love them. Uh, so I'm excited to, to get this book started once I finish Fuzz by Mary Roach. My last title for today, um, I, a few episodes ago, we talked about the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix, which I believe Greg and I both watched. Um, so after I watched that series of films, I decided to give one of the Fear Street novels a shot. Um, the Lost Girl by R.L. Stein is not one of the original Fear Street novels from the 90s. I was actually very much not a fan of horror and was terrified of anything R.L. Stein did when I was a kid. Um, but this is from sort of, there was a reboot of the Fear Street series five, six, seven, ten 10 years ago. Um, so this is one of those sort of relaunch titles. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. Um, sorry, so this is a relaunch title. Um, and uh, I read it through Overdrive, which is our online um, uh, ebook resource that you have access to with your library card. So let us know if you need help accessing that. And it was good. It was a fast read. It's basically about a girl from the past who maybe shows up in the present, but maybe she's a ghost. Is she a witch? Is she a witch ghost? Is she the ghost of a witch? Like it's, it's very sort of teenagery and overdramatic. And it, it's sort of like, not the best writing, but still really fun, very fast paced, it doesn't drag. Um, and it gave me a really good sense of nostalgia uh, for the original sort of Fear Street era of horror, I guess, even though I didn't read it. So maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, those are my titles. I hope you check them out. Uh, let us know if you want to request any of them. And I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Greg. Thank you, uh, Liz. Um, and uh, I'm now I know I have some uh, reading to do. Also, fungi are, they are really weird. I'm both like repelled and like fascinated by them. Like my love for these, for some of these books that I'm about to present. All right, let's get, uh, let's get this show on the road. And share and let's play from the start. All right. Um, so yeah, my name is Greg. Um, I run the science fiction fantasy um, section of the library. So unsurprisingly, I have a I have a fantasy book included in my list. Um, first one I read was the Maleficent Seven um, by Cameron Johnston. Um, so the best way I can describe this novel is un is un unsurprisingly the Magnificent Seven mixed with Suicide Squad and set in a fantasy uh, genre. So 
long story short, this book is um, about this woman by the name of uh, Black Heron, who pretty much is like the big bad of her world. Um, she is like essentially Sauron, uh, Voldemort, and uh, Darth Vader all rolled into one. Um, and she has pretty much just spent all of her time gathering every evil thing in the world to her aid, uh, summoning demons from the netherworld, and just pretty much um, smashing to bits anybody who tries to ever defy her. And she pretty much, you know, like any, pretty much all the wizards, hobbits, and knights in shining armor are dead by like the time of her ascension. And she's this close to wiping out the world. And on the eve of like her total ultimate victory, she like has like an epiphany and goes, do I really want to rule the world? That, that sounds kind of like a lot of work. Like I've killed anybody, everybody who's ticked me off and I've killed anybody, everybody who could possibly avenge them. Uh, I set out what I wanted to do. And uh, you know, this, this like world domination thing kind of sounds uh, a little bit too much. So I'm out. And she just pretty much disappears. Her army literally tears itself apart. Uh, the would-be defenders of good are just kind of left scratching their head and she disappears into retirement for 40 years and just becomes like a mom who raises a family and is in this small little town out in the middle of nowhere just a part of like the city council and you know just just content to be like a sweet 70 year old woman who nobody has any idea about her dark past um so you know she's uh you know but unfortunately her uh bingo nights are kind of put on uh hold because as it turns out 40 years later her village is threatened by this invading army of um knights in shining armor and by knights i'm in shining armor i mean religious fanatics who pretty much murder and execute anybody who does not agree with their idea of what pure is so if you are somebody who's remotely different from their set of ideals they're going to kill you and she realizes that you know this is not going to do because you know she has a family there and everything so the only thing she can do to save the, her village is find a few of her generals and get the band back together and like pretty much have a last stand against like this group of uh over-the-top zealots uh and witch hunters um now, again, this would be kind of like in any other story would be kind of like a heroic band of misfits and such like this. But in this case, her army consists of a manipulative necromancer who sucks the souls out of her uh, out of her victims, a vampire with an incredibly ravenous a appetite, a, um, a literal demigod, um, the most terrifying orc warlord you've ever seen, um, a pirate queen who has eldritch Lovecraftian powers, um, and Got, and a scientist who uh, has never heard ever in his, his life of the Hippocratic Oath. So these are the heroes uh, and um, you just have, uh, and it's all about them trying to like get, not tear each other apart and kill the, uh, kill the people who are gonna wipe out this city. Um, it's like I said, it's, it's an interesting read. I, it's a lot of fun. You're not, if you're not gonna learn anything, if you're just wanting something like what is essentially the, um, book equivalent of an action story, um, then this book is for you. There's a lot of like fight scenes. There's a lot of cool uh, things that go on with magic. Um, it's um, it's very gory. Uh, if this was a movie, it'd be rated R. So if you do not like gore, I would not recommend it. Um, but you know, if you're like a fan of, um, I don't know, if you're a fan of like epic battle scenes and uh, in fantasy books and like Die Hard or anything like that, um, I'd say go for it. Uh, it's fun. It's just, you know, it's I kind I have a fun mindless mindless read. Ah, uh, my next book, Deviant, um, the shocking true story of Ed Gein, the original Psycho by um, Harold Scheidler. Um, now, um, I just want to say this up front, even though I love a lot of spooky horror, creepy um, stuff. I'm not really one for true crime. True crime actually kind of creeps me out. Um, monsters are like really cool and fascinating to me, but people just being awful to each other um, isn't usually, it's it's just something that I usually don't, um, I don't really try to read. However, the story of Ed Gein is something of a morbid, it's like a morbid fascination in some ways because like the thing to understand, I know that, um, the thing to understand about Ed Gein is that he was 
a man from the 1950s who um, was uh, found doing the some of like the most horrific crimes um, you can think of. Um, so many that I kind of hesitate to talk about them, like in this book group. Um, what I can say is, is that even though we didn't have as much as a body count as say like, or he didn't hurt as many people as say like Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, his, the, the, the damage he did to American culture was so strong that he inspired three of the most famous horror movies um, like known to American cinema, including uh, Psycho, uh, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Silence of the Lambs. So if um, that gives you an idea of who this person is, um, um, you're not, you know, you're, you're not too far off. Um, but yeah, long story short, um, he was found to have, um, he was kind of considered like the local, um, the local oddball. Um, nobody really thought that, um, nobody really thought too much of him. Um, but then it found, then people found out that he had murdered like two women and um, done a bit of grave robbing. Um, and it, um, and pretty much decorated his house. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's pretty grim. Um, it's a, I started this book in June. I only just finished it like last week because it was that grim that it took me that long to read so um i don't know if uh if violence or anything um violence especially violence towards women um shocks you i um you know really upsets you totally understandable you would not want to pursue this book don't i mean it was really fascinating to me but i don't i i don't really think i'm going to pick this one up again um and uh and uh, as nice to say, um, but it is in it is a uh, it is an interesting look into the mind of um, of a uh, really um, uh, troubled individual. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I got. Next book, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Ah, so uh, since I'm going to be redoing this for a book group for. Um, for next uh, month, I am not going to say uh, too much about it because uh, you know you have to come and hear my uh, my full fledged opinion during the uh, book group. But um, what I will say is that this is without a doubt one of my favorite horror uh, novels of all time. Um, unlike the other two books that I was mentioning, there is not a lot of gore in this. Uh, it is a book that is um, much more heavy psychological. Um, than it is um, about like jump scares or anything like that. Um, Shirley Jackson is credited to being like the the like the like uh, catalyst for what we think of as the American haunted house. And I agree with that 100%. But to just give you kind of like a summary or a synopsis of what this book is about, um, there is um, a group of people who are trying to do some paranormal research into Hill House, which is this house that has been around for about just shy of a century and it's had a really troubled past. People have died there under mysterious circumstances. People who haven't died there tend to leave pretty quickly. Um, they tend to not give too many reasons why, but it's pretty obvious that they think something is wrong with this place, despite it being prime real estate. And the longer, and at first the people who are there you know, they're kind of enjoying themselves and, and getting to know the place and having a good time. Um, but they start to hear, but it, it soon becomes apparent that maybe something is there. And if they're not careful, it's going to claim them as one of their own. But it's a really interesting thought process about, it's a really interesting take about whether or not you're reading a haunted, like a haunted house story, or whether or not you are just really witnessing um, the um, slow uh, um, decay of somebody's sanity. It's really creepy. It is really spooky. And I love it so much. Um, but, and that's all I'm going to say. But uh, I recommend it. 10 out of 10 stars, all that stuff. So last, and uh, definitely not least, um, my final book that I have been currently reading is Yours Cruelly, Elvira, Mem Memoirs of the Mistress of the Dark uh, by Cassandra Peterson. Um, so 
Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Elvira it was a um, is a famous horror um, horror movie host. Uh, back in the eighties, she had a show where she pretty much did um, a uh, show about like horror movies and B movies, and she'd do a lot of um, she'd make a lot of jokes and be and make a lot of puns. Um, and um, unlike um, unlike a lot of other horror movie hosts at the time who were kind of doing like a Tales from the Crypt thing or something like that, um, where it's like either like kind of they're playing it off as the like Crypt Keeper who's supposed to be like a spooky guy or kind of like not very, very getting like a very creepy persona. Elvira was very much doing, um, well, the the opposite of that, a, a very smart, attractive, um, hilarious like host who's making a lot of puns and just um, having a good time with it all. Um, so this is about Cassandra's, so essentially the book is about Cassandra Peters' uh, life before Elvira, how she developed Elvira and where, um, where she currently is at right now. Um, this is a really funny book. I recommend listening to it on tape, um, like on audio, because Cassandra Peterson narrates it and just her, her delivery of the dialogue just has made me laugh several times. Um, there, she's lived a very, one heck of a life. Um, there's many moments you are reading this and you're like, how did she survive that? She got to do that. Um, she, wait, did she just hang, spend an entire night with Jif, just hanging out with Jim, Jimi Hendrix and just talking about like the political corruption of the system? This is like, that, that does happen. It's just, it's, it's just awesome. Um, and it's, and, uh, oh yeah. And just like, um, uh, it, uh, and it, like running, like running away from like all these other folks, um, having, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. I'm rambling here, but I just, I cannot go into detail how, how epic of a life this is, um, and how, and, uh, and also in the highs and lows are just something to behold. Um, I will also say that there are some very sobering moments she doesn't shy away from, next, namely like sexual assault and how she had to deal with that and uh, the importance of the, um, her, her, um, like her recognition of the importance of the Me Too movement um, and how um, that's, and, and how that's uh, been coming into play. Um, also, um, one of, as a lot of people probably know, um, Cassandra Peterson just came out, um, just came out like, I believe it was last week, um, as in being married to a woman for about 19 years. And it's not a long description, but I am, I, I am, I don't consider myself a sappy guy, but it is one of the sweetest chapters that I've ever gotten to read. And it is just, it just, it makes me so happy that through a lot of stuff that she's had to go through, um, that, you know, something like that happens. And it just, it's, you know, it definitely put a smile on my face. So uh, if you want to, uh, you'll laugh, uh, you'll cry, you're definitely going to learn a couple things. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I uh, pick up a copy when you can. Um, uh, 11 out of 10. So thank you. And uh, oh, and I am so sorry, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Laura. Was it better than cats? You laugh, you'll cry. It's better than cats. Did I just date myself with that reference? A lot better. <laughs> much, much better than cats. Um, I, I'd go to several viewings of the, of the behind the true story. <laughs> um, thank you, Greg. Uh, let me get my slides and let me just say for something completely different. Um, my books are all very different genre wise than what you have heard previously. Um, so my first book is So Many Beginnings by Bethany C. Morrow. Uh, so Many Beginnings is in the author's words, a remix, not a remake, not a takeoff on Little Women. Uh, to quote the author from an interview uh, she gave to NPR earlier this month, uh, basically, and this is her words, basically Little Women is considered historical fiction. But as a black woman, I've been excluded from that narrative. It seems like the kind of property that no matter how many times it's revisited, it's the same. It's for white girls. Uh, this interview, by the way, I just linked it in um, our chat. So I definitely recommend um, reading or listening to it. 
Um, in fact, I, that is Laura now talking, not um, Bethany Morrow, implore you to not uh, draw any direct lines between um, this book and the, the original novel, as will ruin what is really honestly otherwise a great reading experience. Um, so don't, aside from the fact Little Women is in the title, and yes, the family is named March, just don't think about the Little Women. This book deserves to stand on its own, and it's its own book. Um, so with that being said, um, the plot of Swinney Beginnings, um, Meg, Joe, short for Joanna, Beth, short for Bethlehem, and Amy, short for Amethyst, along with their parents, are living on the Freedman's Colony on Roanoke Island in North Carolina. Uh, this was a real establishment founded in 1863. Um, it's after um, this family's enslavement further south. I'm ashamed to say that I knew next to nothing about the Freedman's Colony prior to reading this book and only had been taught about the Lost Colony in regards to Roanoke Island, as I'm sure many of you were probably taught in school. Uh, there's a lot of history we were not taught as we are discovering. Uh, through the four sisters' eyes, we see that being free of enslavement did not mean that life suddenly became easy. The Union is not only so altruistic, nor is the North a panacea, as Joe and Amy learn when they move to Boston in order to, for Amy to pursue dancing. The sisters are very well developed as characters and it's very easy to see them as their own characters and not as counterparts to the original novel. There's just so much love and warmth within the family and I would have liked to have spent more time with them. Um, it's also encouraged me to learn more about the nuances of emancipation and the post-Civil War. Um, one of the books recommended by Morrow in her afterword is Time Full of Trial by Patricia Click, which is actually about the Roanoke Freeman's Colony. And that's a book that I plan on seeking out now that I've read this title. Uh, my next book is Eleanor by Di David Michaelis, a biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the first lady who redefined the meaning of the term first lady. I was inspired to read this after watching the Ken Birds documentary on the Roosevelts, as well as seeing a one woman show about Eleanor Roosevelt over the summer. I'm still reading this very detailed biography, which is a warts and all portrayal of a woman who, in my opinion, is the best Roosevelt. And I'm sorry, you Franklin and Teddy fans, but it's Eleanor. Fight me on that. I have to admit that I've been guilty of deifying Eleanor Roosevelt. When I was nine years old, I told someone that she was my favorite dead child, dead person. I was a weird child. Sorry, I'm reading. I, we have a script that we read. And I, I was a weird child. Uh, and that I would just automatically say that. But in addition to all of her socially minded activism and her role in the formation of the United Nations, she was human and had flaws and I was glad to know the whole person. The book is dense and it's definitely taken me a while, but I'm definitely enjoying it as well as the greater context of the history at the time of each section. My third book is Twins by Varian Johnson and Shannon Wright which is a graphic novel and the story of Maureen and Francine, identical twins, but the start of sixth grade are finding themselves drifting apart. Francine, especially, is looking to expand her horizons and friend group, and Maureen is feeling left out. Told from the point of view of Maureen, she's devastated to learn the reason the twins are in separate classes is not because of a scheduling mistake on the part of the school, but because her sister requested it. One thing leads to another and the two end up running against each other for class president. The book really gets deep into the feelings of isolation, especially at this age. And we realize we've all been there as we all realize that we are drifting apart from our best friends. And of course, the added tension of the fact that the best friend in this case happens to be your identical twin who you live with. What I really appreciate the book though is the characterization of all the characters include, and including Francine, who does not come off as a villain as sometimes a drifting away best friend does in these cases. And she herself is a very sympathetic character. The parents are also a large part of the story and are well-established. This is a good read alike for fans of Jerry Craft's New Kids series or the Smiling Guts books by Raina Tagemeyer. And last but very much not least, is the adorable A Parade of Elephants by Kevin Hankies. This book is a collection of verse and illustrations of elephants doing everything, everyday things, such as marching or going to bed or counting. The tone is sweet and the illustrations are so colorful. Look at that cover. I mean, is that just not so cute? Um, each page is just cuter than the next. And I think I must have read this at least 20 times before I returned it. I just want to give this book a hug. I just, 
I just loved it so. Um, so those are my books. And who would like to share some TV show or movies they like to talk about? I think Liz, I think you mentioned you had okay, one. Yeah, I can start. Um, so just last night, I finished watching um, the first and so far only season of Reservation Dogs, which is a comedy on Hulu. Highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, it is a, a, a show created by Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi for FX. Um, it features an entirely indigenous cast, uh, excuse me, entirely indigenous writers and directors um, and almost entirely indigenous American cast and production team. Um, it's set in Oklahoma and it follows four friends, Elora, um, Bear, Cheese, and Willie Jack um, as they sort of go through their daily lives as four indigenous people um, living under, you know, the consequences of colonialism basically and, you know, um, how frustrating that life can be but it's also so funny and so heartfelt and um the writing is so good and i have to give a special shout out to the actress paulina alexis who plays willie jack she's amazing she i like want to go and watch her entire catalog of acting work because she's she's just such a good actress um i highly recommend it there's another uh, actor in it dallas goldtooth he's a comedian and one of the founders of the 1491 uh, comedy group. He plays a spirit uh, that visits one of the characters every few episodes, and he's a, a hilarious and amazing. And um, just so glad that I started watching it, and I cannot wait for season two. Thank you. I've been really curious about that show. Uh, I my whole social media feed, I feel like, is full of um, re uh, references to Reservation Dogs, and I have yet to read a bad word about it. And uh, I. I, I really want to seek it out. I, I definitely so uh, glad to hear another positive um, take on it. And uh, I actually wrote it down what you're saying, and I can't wait to watch it. Uh, great. What would you like to share? Um, so there's a couple things that I guess I've been doing. Um, one of them is, well, as we all know, my favorite time of the year is coming up Halloween season, October, I guess. Um, so I haven't been really able to contain it. So I've been watching like a bunch of movies, um, going with the connection of, uh, the Elvira, um, memoir I was reading. Apparently Elvira's, the first horror movie Elvira ever watched was, um, The House on Haunted Hill, uh, starring, starring Vincent Price, um, which is, uh, Maggie, Maggie, my wife and I watched it together and, um, it's essentially this, it's a 1959 horror movie. So every member of the family could essentially watch this and be absolutely fine. But back in the day, it was terrifying. William, William, supposedly William Castle um, is the director who's big on the jump scares and, and just like shocking stuff and screeches. But long story short, it's about like um, a eccentric millionaire played by Vincent Price who's pay, who says everybody can like, he invites like five people to a mansion and says like, if you stay here for the night, $10,000 is yours, um, provided that you survive. And supposedly there's ghosts and all sorts of stuff. And it's just, it's very hammy. It's over the top. If it was done by anybody else, it would be a mess. But because it is Vincent Price at his most Vincent Price, it is absolute gold. Um, the, he shows them in the basement, like there's a pit of acid and you're just like, why is there a pit of acid? How does this work? Why, why did like, I'm pretty sure that's against like housing regulations and such, but I don't know, but you're just like, okay. And honestly, if there's a plot, but if you start to ask questions, the plot does not begin to make sense. You're like, because there's, there's some strict rules that are played, um, set up and how, what you can, can and can't do. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, if he did a, how did he, how was he able to do B and then, but you know what, you just, you don't, you don't think too hard. Just, just enjoy it. Um, so, you know, very, I, I'd recommend it for a laugh. Um, definitely gets you into the Halloween season. Um, the second um, thing I've been watching and uh, I made a mistake because I was talking to you folks about it beforehand. 
um, but I got the title wrong. It's actually um, the documentary I've been watching is Bully Coward Victim, um, which is about the life of Roy Cohn. Um, for those of you who don't know who Roy Cohn is, um, he it was a lawyer who, um, who rose to power during the McCarthy era. Um, he helped Joseph McCarthy um, pursue, like, hunt down supposed communists um, and also uh, people who were perceived to be um, homosexual and uh, pretty much either arrest them or have them banned from his from their jobs. And the thing that's very hypocritical about this is that Roy Cohn himself was a gay man. Um, and it was very, like, it was not a, really a secret. If it was, it was a very open-ended secret, but he saw no issue at all with, um, with um, like, persecuting and destroying the lives of um, people he was accused of being gay or actually were gay, um, and also living... Um, living, um, being gay. It was, um, he, uh, he, I, the, the disconnect that he had with that is infuriating and heartbreaking. Um, and also after McCarthy, um, pretty much lost power and was, um, kicked out, he, uh, had a life of, um, helping the mob, um, helping Reagan get into power, um, working for the Trumps, um, and, uh, and several other, other, um, factors of American culture and the fact and for good or ill like and a lot of it is for ill he's uh he affected he just his impact on the modern day world is astounding um and the reason why and well it's history so I don't think I'm spoiling anything um the reason why it, it is titled that is because he was a he died in the 80s because he contracted AIDS, and as soon as he did, um, he, everybody who was an associate of his, or worked for him, or employed him, pretty much abandoned him because, well, you know, incorrectly back in those days, uh, AIDS was viewed as a disease that only gay people got. And when, and even though he was an open-ended seek, his his sexuality was an open-ended secret. That was a um, that just made it very public. So they just pretty much abandoned him to uh, die alone. And he has a, and he has a, um, um, he's actually part of the AIDS quilt, um, which is, and it's titled bully here, Roy Cohn, bully coward victim, because, you know, as much as he persecuted them, um, they, the gay community also recognized he was part of that community, no much, no matter how hard he tried to deny it. And it is a it, it is a fascinating look at a rather dark aspect of our history. And uh, so, sorry to uh, go on a I'll go on a uh, whole speech there. My bad. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds fascinating. What um wh where is that? Is that streaming or where is that available? Um, I believe you can find it on Hulu. Oh, it is Hulu. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know. Of Ray Cohn, I, mean, I know the name certainly, um, but I don't know much about him or his life. I actually don't think I knew he died of AIDS. Um, so um, fascinating to watch that, and sounds like a kind of complex person. Is is that the right term to use? But uh, definitely um, sounds like a very complicated human being. Certainly. Uh, yeah, he's a. Uh, it's I. <laughs> there's a few. There's a couple words that could be used to describe him. He also is a character in Angels in America, uh, played by Al Pacino. So, oh yes, that, yeah. There, so. say, I think that's how I knew. So I, knew that. I actually haven't seen Angels in America, but I read a review, and I think that's how I knew the name originally. Because yeah, better no, living through performing arts. Uh, it's I, actually not a bad. Yeah, and actually that was a. It was a good. It's a good introduction, and uh, yeah, no, but um, uh, definitely, definitely worth a watch. It's it's fascinating and you know tragic <laughs> thank you um so yeah i just i watched a couple um on netflix which you can watch netflix shows as a reminder um uh, we have roku's of the library that we loan out that have our netflix subscription so if you don't have one i uh, have a way of accessing it uh one is the third season of sex education uh for those who are unfamiliar with this show it is a british show um, about pretty much um, the son of a um, of a sex therapist who 
in the first season basically starts a clinic to give um, sex education to his fellow students because the curriculum at his school is not really doing um, an adequate job. I, I did not do a good job at describing it. I'm not doing the show, sir. Uh, I'm doing. I'm not doing the show justice. Um, Jillian Anderson was actually my gateway into the show and the reason I started watching it. She plays the mother in, in question um, and she's amazing because she's amazing in everything. Um, I would love to see more of her. I mean, the focus is mainly on her son and his classmates, but uh, she's she's great and she gets better and she's a very flawed character, um, which I always appreciate. Um, the show is not for everyone. I get it. It does. It can be. Um, does not hold back at all with a lot of description um, as well as some of the visual content. So um, I realize that's not everyone's taste and that's fine. Um, but I I think it's a very sex positive show um, and I very inclusive. Um, there is, uh, without spoiling too much in the second season, uh, there's really a great um, female empowerment moment uh, among a lot of the um, uh, teenage girls um, who are in the show who um, after a result of something uh, awful happening to one of them on a bus I don't want to get too much into it but it's really it's it's a beautiful moment in the show and I cry when I see it I even cry when I watch it in interviews um, this season um, I think it's still good I mean it, there's definitely a couple of you know like uh, I mean there's a couple of contrivances like there are with any show uh, that I was like oh come on but for the most part, I really enjoyed it. I think the acting is amazing. Um, I think, I don't think any of the teenagers are played by actual teenagers, but a good number of them look like teenagers and really all that's all that matters. A couple of them do look like they're 35. Um, the, um, the female lead for lack of a better word, I think she's a lead. I'm, she does not look 17, but she's a really good actress and she's a great character. So you kind of don't care, um, but she's very clearly not a teenager. Uh, I, again, I, I recommend it again if, you're okay with it. I said it, it can be a little graphic. So if you're okay with that, I do recommend it. Um, the other show I'm watching on Netflix is uh, the latest season of the Great British Baking Show. So again, something completely different. Uh, the first season, the first episode has already aired. Uh, so I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen the first episode yet, which is really great is that Netflix is showing it pretty much simultaneously minus three days with the UK, which before we would sometimes get these uh, episodes almost a year later when they were on PBS. And even when they were first on Netflix, we get them maybe six months later. Now we get them only three days later. The problem is for someone like me, I would say a good number of the people I follow on Twitter are associated with the Great British Baking Show or the Great British Bake Off, as it's really called in the UK. And uh, I always make the mistake of going on Twitter on Tuesdays and finding out who was Star Baker who got kicked off. So I now have to take remind myself not to do that. Um, I just, I'm not a big reality show person, but this reality show is just so touching. Even the mean judge is not that mean. In fact, it's not really mean at all. Um, I, everyone is so appealing. You feel sad when anyone leaves. Everyone else feels sad when someone leaves. And at the end, you win a cake plate. That's it. You're not winning a recording contract. You're not winning a book contract. A lot of the more popular people on the shows do have um, end up writing cookbooks. I mean, Nadia Hussein, who is my favorite, uh, probably contestant, um, and spoiler alert, she did win one of them. It was years ago now. I feel like I'm okay saying that at this point. Um, she probably, I would say, is arguably probably been the most successful. and. Partly, I think I've bought every single thing she's written, so I'm contributing to that success because she's amazing. Um, but, you know, that it's it's just a great show. It's just, it's a feel-good show. Even if you're not into baking, I do like baking a lot. Um, although I'm certainly not ever good enough to get in this show, partly because my stuff tastes good, but it doesn't always look good. Um, and I will say every season, um, I don't think it hasn't happened yet so far. There's always these key things that some of the contestants don't know how to do. It always frustrates me. It's like, don't you watch this show? There's always that one person that doesn't know how to make puff pastry or doesn't know how to make pot of shoe. Someone in this episode didn't know how to make butter. It's like, the show's been on for, I think it's 10 years at this point, going back to even seasons of Britain that we never got in this country. You have to know, you have to know how to make some key baking stuff. So that's always my one minor critique but it's very very minor uh, I love it Liz I know you also watch Great British Big Show I don't know if you've seen it yet this season yes I have watched the first episode I um 
love it. I love my my current favorite contestant just because he's so I don't know. I just feel an affinity for him is Jurgen because yes. he's just so like quiet and chill, and he just says, "Oh, he's, the ways that he talks is very calming to me." Um, I don't know. I just I really like Jurgen. Uh, I'm really excited for Biscuit Week, which will air on Friday. And I the only bad thing related to this particular program is I learned over the weekend that my father does not like watching it. Oh, no. So <laughs> that's completely shaken me to my core. Um, but other than that, yeah, no, I'm, I'm like so excited for this new season. And since you mentioned Biscuit Week, I can't tell you how many seasons I've watched for like that biscuits just mean like cookies, basically. Mm-hmm. I was like, they're not making biscuits. I So you, it's very educational. You learn a lot of British, or not slang, because they did mm-hmm. it first, but yeah. uh, British words for that we use different words for. And um, my parents, um, I, may, I make them watch it. I They claim they like it. Um, I'm curious if they're just saying that to please me, but I think they do. But uh so hopefully maybe your dad will change his mind. I don't know. Um, I'm, done. I'm just going to let it go. It's more yeah. important things to worry about. And sometimes we have to let things go with people we love. So, <laughs> um, All right. Well, I think we are pretty much running out, uh, out of time here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We enjoyed it with you as well. Um, please join us um, next month um, as we, uh, I believe it is Monday, October 25th. Let me just double check that. And hopefully I will record in the right day. Yes, Monday, October 25th at 2.30. Um, we are looking forward to talking with you then. And we wish you a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Do the same way. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.